Welcome to the Smart Connector, the podcast that helps entrepreneurs be the leader their ideal people love. Build your influence, wealth and success, attract others for all the right reasons and become a Smart Connector, the architect of your amazing business and life. Welcome to the Smart Connector podcast. Today, I'm so excited to be interviewing Michael Houlihan, who's founder of the world's most loved and widely sold wine brand, Barefoot Wines. And what a story he has to tell. Michael and his partner, Bonnie, founded the iconic Barefoot brand in 1986 in the laundry room of a rented farmhouse in the Sonoma Hills of California with no money and no knowledge about the wine industry. Due to their lack of experience and the complexities of the wine business, they ran into one setback after another that almost killed their brand and business several times over. Today, Barefoot's got more than 30 wines that are distributed across the globe. Michael and Bonnie sold the business to Ian J. Gallo in 2005, and they wrote the New York Times bestseller about their journey, The Barefoot Spirit, How Hardship, Hustle and Heart Built America's Number One Wine Brand. So I am so excited to have Michael here with us. Welcome, Michael. Well, thank you for having me, Jane. It's a pleasure. You have such an incredible story, Michael. It's it's amazing. You've got decades of incredible experience and trials and tribulations and having come out the other side and built really the world's most iconic wine brand is just a phenomenal achievement. So I guess in this podcast, the first question that I'd like to ask you is, how did you do it? <laughs> well, you know... I guess ignorance is bliss. You know, people say, uh, follow your passion. Uh, We followed our opportunity, but we followed our opportunity passionately. So the opportunity was a winery that uh, actually had declared bankruptcy that owed uh, our client uh, about $300,000 for grapes that he had sold them. And uh, we were able to negotiate a trade Instead of money, they paid us in wine and bottling services. So here we had all this wine and all this bottling services, and we thought, well, we'll just come up with a label and a marketing program, learn the distribution system, and create an international brand. You know, how hard could that be, right? How long long did that (laughs) possibly take? (laughs) And how long did it take? (laughs) It it took 20 years. But, you know, it, it, we thought it would take five. So we were only off by a factor of, you know, three, four hundred percent. So what we did is because we didn't know anything about our industry, we were hat in hand and we went out and asked everybody who was in the industry what we should do. But we didn't ask the white collar workers. We didn't ask the people who were established in the wine industry. We ask the people, you know, with dirt under their fingernails. We say, make friends with people in low places. But we don't mean that to be disparaging. We mean that to be sincere. People who run the forklifts, people who run the trucks, people who run the bottling lines, they're the people that really know what moves and what doesn't because they see it in terms of production. And they can also give us some great insights into what the label has to look like and everything else. So that's how Barefoot got started. It got started on a debt. And we we basically took over the debt and paid back the grower uh, and built the Barefoot Wine brand up over many years. Michael, you must have known a bit about business to come in and take over the debt. So what were you doing before you started in this business? Well, it's interesting that Bonnie and I were both business consultants, but we were not in the wine industry necessarily. I had a background working for civil service, and I worked uh, in rebuilding the cities. So I worked with businesses that were kind of in harm's way and helped them move away from the wrecking ball and reestablish themselves and do so without going bankrupt because they would sue the government if that happened. So I learned a lot about business by helping businesses. 
Bonnie, on the other hand, worked to help people organize their offices and oversee services. So she had a, a more of a practical hands-on approach. You know, I was kind of big picture and she was very much details. Well, that's great, isn't it? Because you obviously complemented one another right from the start because a big picture and a detailed person had the perfect pairing, really, isn't it? Yes, but as we say uh, when we speak on the stage, kids, don't try this at home. <laughs> you, okay. you don't, you don't really, you don't really want to go into business with your significant other unless you have really set down some rules and you have a high degree of respect for the other person's skill set, and uh, it better be different than yours. And that way, it becomes more of a team approach. And I think you really need to stay out of the other person's way, not micromanage them, not second guess them. And I think that that's one of the things that kind of breaks down in uh, close relationships. Plus, you know, you obviously you're not going to talk business in the bedroom and it's not very polite to talk business over the meal. So and like Bonnie likes to buy a ticket, you know, this is, you know, before COVID, of course, to some wonderful place on the planet for two weeks, non-refundable, so that we can keep <laughs> the romance in our relationship. We see that date coming and boy, we just organize around it. Oh, that's that. That's really, really nice. And I've, I've actually interviewed other successful uh, business owners who have also built very, very successful businesses with their partner. In fact, they they both they all say the same thing that you have to have some boundaries and some actually separate your business life from your personal life because otherwise it's just like well you can never get away from your work, right? Right. She put me in a whole nother room. She said. You know, you conduct business at the top of your lungs and you hit the keyboard like it was an old fashioned typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So, Michael, I'd, I'd love to hear about the trials and the tribulations in the early days, because it's always hard to get a new business off the ground, isn't it? Well, like I say, you know, ignorance is bliss. If we had known what we were up against, we probably wouldn't have done it. But to give you some example, we went out and we asked people what it should look like and everything else. We did that. And there's a great scene from our new audio theater where I walk into one of the largest buyer in California's office. He's, he's, a, he's a, a beverage buyer. And uh, I ask him what he wants. And he tells me that nobody's ever asked him that before. And then he tells me what he wants. We go back, we put it together, we bring it in, we show it to him, and he doesn't buy it because he, nobody knows barefoot. Nobody's ever heard of anything called barefoot. Plus, putting a foot on a wine label was very radical in 1986. Everybody was apologizing for not being French enough in those days, and it was a male-dominated industry, and our brand was designed really for a 37-year-old mom with two kids picking up wine at a supermarket uh, as a staple, a Tuesday night wine, not a, not a brag wine, not a Saturday night wine. Mm. We had a very interesting niche and it was, it, there was a lot of missionary work to get the buyers to understand that they could put a non-vintage wine on the market and that it would sell. Of course, for us, you know, we were outsiders. We wanted it to be non-vintage so we could use blends to make it taste the same. Because if mm. she was buying it on a regular basis and all of a sudden it tasted funny, she wouldn't buy it anymore. So it was a different market, you know, going after the female shopper. But I, but what's interesting was that it was 78% of the shoppers were females and 100% of the buyers in those days were males. So there was that oh. issue to overcome. We were able to overcome it very slowly. Um, we didn't have money for advertising. And, uh, you know, the, the, the big chains wouldn't take us. So we had to go out to the mama papas and all the independents. And, you know, I had to personally sell it. And uh, I had to promise them that it, would, that it would move, right? Because otherwise it would just sit there and use up their precious shelf space. 
but it didn't move and time went by and I got really scared. And then I got a phone call and it was from a guy in Chinatown in San Francisco who represented a neighborhood association. He said, Hey, you're a big rich guy from, you know, the wine country. I just need 50,000 bucks. And I said, are you, you got the right number, pal? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I, I don't have one of those 50. I said, but I do have some wine. I'll give you some wine and maybe it'll loosen some people up at your fundraiser. They'll write a bigger check or maybe you can auction it off. You can use it to, you know, get some swings and slides and sandboxes for your kids after school park. And he went, okay. So he took it. He was begrudging because he really wanted to check. But, you know, three or four weeks later, we noticed that the wines that were in the stores that were near his neighborhood really took off. And we saw that again and again in neighborhood after neighborhood. So the way that we built Barefoot was not through commercial advertising, but it was by supporting local worthy causes. Wow, that's amazing. What a story, because it's so contrarian. Most (laughs) people would never think that a wine or any kind of a brand would take off because you were supporting local charitable initiatives. But that's amazing, amazing, giving value first. What's interesting about it is that in retrospect, when you think about it, uh, if you pay money on advertising, you know, you just got to keep advertising, keep advertising, and then you're conspicuous by your absence. It's like shooting a shotgun into the air, hoping to hit a duck. But the kind of thing that we were doing, which was worthy cause marketing, we called it, was really targeting groups that were in the neighborhoods that were surrounding the stores where our wines were. So in a kind of a back-ass word way, it was brilliant because we were dealing with the folks who lived in the neighborhood and they, they went into the store anyway. So now they they saw that we were supporting them and they had a social reason to buy our product in their neighborhood store. So... It worked. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I think that that's that's great. So you went from this very very small time little uh, wine brand that was just being sold in local stores, and the supermarkets wouldn't take it, and it was very much you and Bonnie doing all the work. To how on earth did you get there to being the world's number one most loved wine brand? What a journey. Yeah, yeah, what a journey is right. Well, the thing is, there's brands and then there's labels, okay? And I want to be completely transparent. When we sold the brand to Ian J. Gallo in 2005, they hired us to show them how we did it. And we did. We spent a year with them and showed them how we did it. And what it was was basically a culture it was an attitude. It wasn't a label. It was a brand that had a personality that people could identify with. Um, for, for one thing, uh, we supported uh, a lot of uh, educational human rights and environmental causes. Uh, one of them that we supported was the Surfrider Foundation, the International Surfrider Foundation. Um, they started in Southern California And we went down there and we said, hey, we're barefoot, you're barefoot. We wouldn't want to step on a piece of glass or oil or something on the beach or put our foot in polluted water. How can we help you? And they said, well, you know, we're trying to raise money to clean the oceans and whatnot. We said, okay, we'll put tags on our bottles in the supermarkets in Southern California, and we will make the buyers aware of the problem in the oceans and what you're doing about it and ask them to contribute. And we were able to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for the Surfrider Foundation by, get this, not just give us six bucks for the wine, but give us six bucks for the wine and then give these guys 10 bucks, <laughs> you know, which is an amazing approach rather than, you know, buy one, get one free or $2 off with your sausage type deal. I love that. And I have these conversations often with people about how purpose driven businesses are much more successful than profit driven businesses because people get behind them, don't they? And that's what happened, isn't it? For you. It really is. And, you know, when people say, you know, what do you attribute the success of Barefoot to? I say the success of Barefoot was what Barefoot stood for. 
and I don't mean that to be a pun, but it stood for human rights, the environments. I mean, we supported the uh, LGBT community long before it was mainstream to do so. In fact, our first national sales manager was an out-of-the-closet gay man. And we, and this was back in the days of AIDS, you know, where people were freaking out. Mm. And there was a lot of ignorance about the gay community yeah. and the disease. And, and so they said, well, aren't you afraid that Barefoot will become the gay wine? And I said, I'm afraid it won't. <laughs> I mean, come mm-hmm. on. Uh, so, so we were way beyond any kind of box. We were totally humane. We were, you know, the whole attitude of Barefoot was inclusive. And you have to remember, we started this brand at a time when wine was exclusive and it was isolated and insulated and you needed a degree in viticulture and enology just to read the labels. And so here we are with, you know, no French on the label. Everything's in plain English, barefoot, an English term, and then the footprint, right? Mm, <laughs> so indeed. so it's, it, would, it was designed to be friendly, that's for sure. Mm. I'm very interested to delve a bit deeper into the name itself. And what inspired you to, to call it Barefoot? I read that when you took over the the business, that that was at a time when the grapes were actually being trod in the traditional way. Was that was that where it all came from, or was it something different? Well, there were a lot of boutique winemakers who were crushing grapes with their bare feet, and it was kind of a novelty. But the reason we called it barefoot was because, you know, barefoot is a part of humanity. Every person on this planet has a bare foot. And when you see a bare foot on the beach, you don't know if it's a man or a woman. You don't know if it's gay or straight. You don't know if it's Jewish or Muslim. You don't know if it's conservative or liberal. All you know is that that's the impression that a human being makes. So it's kind of a universal symbol of humanity. Mm. So that was, that's why we chose it. But the fact that, you know, grapes were crushed that way certainly ties into the wine. And the fact that, you know, when you're barefoot, it's hard to be uptight. You know, you're, you're at the beach or you're at the hot tub or you got your feet up in front of the fire, you're relaxing. Uh, so there's the recreational aspect of barefoot as well. But we liked it because it was easy to pronounce, easy to remember, you know, two two grunts, barefoot, you know, not da 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 da, right? <laughs> oh yeah. I mean that's it's just so so apt, as you said, from those three different perspectives, because it just completely conjures up what you're all about. That's it. And you know, when you really and we work with people today to help them build their brands, define their brands and market their brands. And unfortunately, you know, like us, most people who get into business have preconceived notions about business. You know, they they buy into popularly held misconceptions. And then when they're in business, they tend to to try to play those out. And boy, do they run into some walls when they find out that what they thought wasn't true. So when you when you come up with a brand, you know, it's really how simple it is. It's really, you know, how fast the person can understand it. It's what it stands for. And, you know, it's like a flag, you know, put up, the, run up the flagpole, they say, and see if anybody salutes. Well, that's what the brand is. You run it up the flagpole, but you had better have a complete attitude about that brand. And I mean, today we're working with people to help them uh, build their brands, sell their brands, and even communicate their brand value to their own employees. That's what we're doing with Business Audio Theater, for instance. Mm, I love that. And how do you find, did you find that your employees really got behind the spirit of Barefoot? Talking about employee engagement. Oh, absolutely. In fact, for the last seven years, we had no turnover at all. Wow. And that, that's really saying something. Uh, there were people that we introduced to our competition and helped them get jobs there, but we never had anybody quit. So basically, they believed in the whole spirit of the brand. And I think it was because the way we ran our business, um, we our business was based on two divisions, right? 
sales and sales support. That's it. Now, it doesn't matter if you're the CEO, the CFO, the CTO, the VP, the P. It doesn't matter what your alphabet is. You are in sales support. And that goes for marketing. That goes for production. That goes for uh, the legal department. They're all in sales support. And so what we used to do was ask people who are in sales to visit with the rest of us on a once a quarter basis and tell us the problems they had in the field. And we had enough respect for our own staff that we would let them talk about and solve some of these problems in open uh, brainstorming uh, sessions, um, even though it wasn't their specific specialty. So like one day a guy comes in and he goes, well, I got good news and bad news. Well, what's the good news? Well, the good news is we just got into Publix in Florida. It's the largest chain store in Florida. They got 675 stores. Well, what's the bad news? Well, the bad news is they're going to put us on 60 to test us, but they put us on the bottom shelf. Nobody will see us there. So somebody in the in the crowd says, well, you know, I guess we'll just, we're barefoot. We'll just have to go after the foot traffic then down there on the floor, you know? And so people laugh. And then this, this woman says, you know, that's not such a crazy idea. Why don't we make decaled footprints and lead people from the store door down the aisle and turn them into the place on the floor where barefoot is? So that idea, <laughs> yeah, I know. We did that. We did that in every store in America. And I'm telling you, those sticky wow. feet were hard to get up. <laughs> what a story. Jane, she was she was the receptionist. Really? So so I guess what I'm saying is it's the difference between need to know and know the need. See? Yes. So if your attitude toward your people is they don't need to know that I'm having a marketing problem or they don't need to know that I'm having a financial problem, well, they're not going to help you. But if you tell them what the need is, you're not, they're not only going to help you, but now they feel like you respect them. Mm. So there, there is a good key to how you can keep your people engaged. I love it. So, Michael, what was your big breakthrough then with, with Barefoot? Was there a time when you thought, whoa, wait a minute, something has happened and we're going to go big? Oh, yeah. Well, there was this crazy place in Southern California and they had netting on the wall and the, the guy who was the store manager was wearing a captain's hat and then they would have other people like first mate and crew members. And so the whole thing had this kind of nautical theme. And then they brought in all these interesting canned and jarred foods from all over the world. And people warned us and they said, oh, those people are wacky. You don't want to do business with them. And we went in there and we said, listen, you guys are wacky, but we're wacky. And so we would like to work with you. How can we help? And they said, well, you know, we'd like to take your barefoot and uh, put it up in front of the store because it's kind of a wacky label. And uh, we said, OK, let's do that. Well, that was Trader Joe's, OK, owned by the big German Aldi company. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then they expanded and they built thousands of stores across the United States, and they used Barefoot as their lead. Because if you're in Topeka, Kansas, and you never go to California, but here comes Trader Joe's to Topeka, and you're going, hey, look at this, Maudie, we can go down there and see what they're doing in California. So they go down there, and sure enough, Barefoot is stacked right in front, you know, with all these colorful feet. So it's it's really, when that happened, I knew that we had uh, struck uh, gold. I knew that we had a strategic ally and I knew that there was a company that was actually proud of the fact that we were rebels and was actually using that to promote themselves. Mm, I, I love that because that's all about values and conversations and it all starts with a relationship, doesn't it? Oh, it's all relationships. In business, there's, there's three main relationships. There's the relationship that you have with your employees. And then there's the relationship that you have with your vendors. And then there's the relationship that you have with your buyers. And in every one of those relationships, the other party has to know that you have their best interests at heart. Mm -hmm. In other words, you have to show them who you are before you tell them what you've got. Mm. 
So we've got to the point where you have got your strategic alliance with, with Trader Joe and they are distributing the Barefoot brand across the US. So what next? What happened after that? Well, then another big chain, Kroger's, that was in 28 states decided that they were going to put Barefoot in because they saw the volume that Trader Joe's was doing right under their nose in their own backyard. And so that blew us up even more. And then Albertsons, which was another interstate giant company, uh, they took us on. And, you know, over in England, you know, we did business with Sansbury's and Odd Bins and... Mm. Several oh the the uh, the the English that's what they say they call it the uh, the the British co-op I think they call it and mm-hmm. they have like four or five different store styles so and then we, you know we went over to Germany we did some business with Aldi we we expanded uh, we were in Russia and, and we we really had a blast uh, we had a really big blast in Europe because the Europeans had never seen anything like that you know I remember we were down uh, in Bordeaux at our booth at Vin Expo you know there's like eight thousand wineries there from the entire world and in in this in this big uh, mess and it's about a, a, a kilometer long. These French kids were coming in. I shouldn't say kids who were in their 20s. And they were coming in. They were saying, how come we don't have this in France? And we said, because your father doesn't want you to have it. (laughs) (laughs) You know, so it was, you know, the French were very stuffy in those days, but not the kids. The new generation, they they were tired of that. Mm. So Barefoot appealed, you know, internationally. And uh, we became kind of like the Levi Strauss of American wine. You mm-hmm. know, this is what this is what the average American is drinking. You know, not the snob. You know, but the av- the average Joe. And I mean, certainly barefoot is everywhere here in the UK. I think it's the it's either the the top wine here in the UK or the second top. It's definitely one of the leading brands. And so you've definitely made a very, very big inroad into, well, I mean, we're a big nation of wine drinkers. We love our wine and we love our mid-range, mid-price wine because we like to drink a lot of wine here in the UK. So, <laughs> I, I mean, it's everywhere. It's really everywhere. Well, the British are uh, lovely people. They they do appreciate wines. And, of course, they're close to France. Mm-hmm. I mean, they pretty much invented champagne. And when you take a look at the when you take a look at the culture in the UK, it is a wine culture, so it's a perfect place for you know a medium price, uh, fruity, easy drinking American wine uh, that's fun, and uh, you know it, it gets it gets a little overcast over there, you know, and it's nice to see some bare feet out on a beach once in a while. <laughs> that's true. So, can I talk about your tough times as well, because I think we all have difficult times and challenges in in our businesses. It's inevitable because that's how we grow. They're growing pains, aren't they? So we'd love to hear, I'm sure, about um, some of yours. What, what, What were the biggest challenges that you faced? Well, of course, the biggest challenge we faced was being undercapitalized, right? Mm. Um, We didn't have any money. Uh, You know, we went to the bank and we we tried to get a loan and they said, oh, no, you guys are self-employed. You don't own any property. You know, we're not going to give you any money. Uh, And, you know, we said, well, look, you, you, you guys have financed houses for employees. I, you know, I've approved the forms. I know that you guys have, you know, approved these mortgages for my employees. Oh, that's different. They have a good solid job. See? (laughs) All right. Right, right. That that you had created. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. That these that these these wacky, unstable people had created exactly. <laughs> so so here we are. We we don't have any money, and so we're forced to do things a little differently. Like we talked a little bit about the relationship with your vendors, and I think that this is something that a lot of businesses overlook, and that is if you treat your vendor right your vendor will basically invest in your business and they can invest in your business in a number of ways. They can give you free warehousing for goods. They can front you goods that you don't have to pay on for six months with no interest. 
which is tremendous because if you had to borrow the money to do that, you would be paying interest on the money and you'd have to qualify for the loan, neither one of which we could do. Mm. So we had to build that relationship with that vendor to get over this hurdle. So like I said, when we got into into Florida, we went to our largest vendor, which was a glass company. And we said, listen, you're going to sell a heck of a lot more glass to a $6 wine than you are to a $60 wine, because we're going to have to sell more of it to break even. So we're going to need more glass and it can be your glass. And we just got approved in the store down there in Florida, but we don't have the money to buy the glass. And they said, well, we'll front you the glass. And you can pay us back when you get paid. Well, that was a tremendous breakthrough for us, but it was also a tremendous uh, wall that we were facing. Can you imagine you have a buyer that wants your product, but you can't give your product to the buyer because you don't have enough money to buy the product beforehand. Mm. Yes. <laughs> and you yes. don't qualify for a loan. So th that was tough. The, the other big challenge we had was People would copy our name. They would they would say, oh, Barefoot, that's cool. We'll copy the name. Oh. So we had a group down in South Africa copy the name. Uh, we had a we had a company in Scotland copy the name with with a, a brand that they put on the market in, in England in violation of our UK trademark, in violation of our uh, of our U, our EU trademark. And they basically said, you know, uh, why don't you guys just go run along? You're not going to carry out a lawsuit in, in England. You're you're not going to you're not going to hire a barrister and go for three years for six hundred thousand dollars. You know, yes, you'll win, but you can't sustain the fight. See, wow. so so these are the kind of challenges that we had to face, and I mean they were daily. So how did you resolve that one in the end? The liquor industry in the UK is controlled by about six buyers. You know, they're they're the buyers for the major stores there. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, it was Sainsbury's, uh, Safeway. Let me see. Uh, odd bins and a, and a few other big ones, big chains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I knew who these buyers were. So rather than sue these guys, and they were a big distillery company, up in, they had like 27 distilleries up in Scotland, single malt liquor type stuff, very powerful, lots of money with big legal department. And so we decided we're not going to beat them in a legal battle. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the buyers and we're going to tell the buyers that they're copying us with impunity. Here's a copy of our marks and we cannot stand, you know, testimony uh, and witness to the quality of their product. And there will be confusion in the marketplace. There will be confusion in your market. Mm. And instead of sending that to the six or seven buyers in the UK, we sent it to the chairman of the board of this distillery. And he just freaked out because he knew that the buyers would discontinue both of our products mm. until, it, and, until ownership had been resolved. Yeah. And that would take years, as his lawyer said. So he, he, he said, uh, you know, there must be some mistake here. I don't know why our attorney said that to you. You know, have you sent this out yet? And I said, no. Well, I said, we're going to send it out at five o'clock uh, tomorrow afternoon, Pacific time. All right. <laughs> and he said, oh, well, let's work something out. And I said, well, you better be quick about it. And so he did. He decided to take it off the market. And about, about six months later, it was off the market. But, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat. You know, if somebody... Uh, is a boxer, you know, and uh, they come up to you and they say, you know, let's go boxing. That's when you reach down and you grab the rug from under them and you pull it out and you say, no, we're going to do a different game here. We're going to we're going to play pull the rug out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So so resilience and a an agile mind. That's very important, isn't it, for success in business? Well, you have to. You you certainly have to be able to understand problem solving. It's not, the problems are not necessarily solved the way you think they are or the traditional way. You have to look outside the box for ways to solve the problems uh, that may not be uh, popular or, or may not be commonly used. And one thing's for sure, if, if, 
if uh, necessity is the mother of invention, then uh, being undercapitalized is surely the father. <laughs> you know, it's like they say to the cowboy, I didn't know you could dance. And he says, I didn't know they could shoot. And so <laughs> you see, when you're dodging bullets, you, you really do learn uh, pretty quickly how to stay on your feet. And, and that's, that's what we did. We were, we were under pressure. We were forced to come up with solutions that were out of the box. So, Michael, if you could go back and do it all again, is there something that you would do differently? Oh, I would have a big bottle of aspirin a lot closer to me on the desk. <laughs> no, I, I'll tell you what I would do differently. I would, I would have really tried to better understand the distribution system. You know, when you talk about relationships and you talk about communications, uh, there's some commonly held misconceptions. Now, in our business, we had to make seven sales, which means seven relationships, which means seven communications. It means seven people with seven, di seven different ideas about what they want in order to pass your idea along. Now, our employees, they wanted to know that we had their best interests at heart. They wanted to know that we stood for something beyond the product that they could be proud of. But then there was the distributor's owners. Distributor's owners wanted a strategic advantage. They wanted to know that there was a big supermarket in their territory that was gonna take the brand, that was gonna make them more important to the supermarket. And then their sales manager, he just wanted to make his numbers. So he wanted to know if you had a rep in the territory that was going to make the numbers, even if his own people didn't. And then his own people, the salespeople, they were pretty much coin operated. They wanted to know what's in it for them. How much do they make every time they sell it? And then you had to sell the sales, the, then you had to sell the retailer and the retailer wanted to know if it was going to turn fast. You notice nobody said anything about wine or quality or price yet. You see, mm -hmm. this was the surprise. The surprise is that the people that you have to do business with have different ideas about what they want and you have to satisfy them and they have nothing to do necessarily with your product or your price or your quality. So, and then you get into the store and then you find out that you have to, you have to sell the clerk because the clerk is the one that puts it back on the shelf when it sells out. And he's the one that talks to Mrs. McGillicuddy when she comes in looking for a new wine. So he's got to be taken out to lunch. You got to get him a ball cap. You have to make him feel important. And then if you're lucky, you get to sell Mrs. McGillicuddy, the actual consumer. And let me tell you, most people in business go straight to McGillicuddy. They do not go through those other steps. And so that's what we learned. And that, that was what I would do differently. I would have been a little more humble because I went out there and tried to hit every one of those people with, you know, features and benefits and quality and pricing. <laughs> mm. Yes, yes, I get it. I get it. And of course, people think first and foremost about what's in it for me, don't they? And having to deal with all of those, effectively all of those customers and, and stakeholders, it takes a lot of sophisticated thinking, really, because uh, as you said, you've got to get you've got to get right into their brains and actually think, okay, before those features and benefits, what is their individual pain that they need to relieve? And that's the thing, as you said, you, you had to you had to find out and talk to. Exactly. You know, that requires a level of humility. It requires more listening than talking. You know, no matter how much you're in love with your product or your brand, no matter how much you think it's going to be a, a knockdown, drag out success, you have to really think about the people that you have to get through to do that success and find out what they want. We found out the hard way, but we found out. We spent the first five years trying to beat everybody up with sales pitches that sounded very conventional. And it wasn't for a while that we started to realize, you know, we'd go into a distributor in Florida and we would say, you know, the largest chain store in Florida would like to buy our brand from you. Are you interested in carrying it? See, rhetorical, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, amazing. How did the book come come about? Did somebody ask you to write it or did you just think, you know what, I've had this incredible journey and I just want to I just want to share it with the world? Well, you know, we had quite a staff. Our staff was really the reason for the success of Barefoot. 
the, the, the clever ideas and the solutions, they all came from people that worked for us. And they, they really liked the business style that we, that we uh, executed at Barefoot. And so they said, you know, you guys have to write a book. You have to write a book about business culture because that's what you really did that is super successful is the culture. And of course, you know, owners can't be everywhere all the time and leaders can't be everywhere all the time. So you have to delegate in this life. Well, when you delegate, you're delegating to the person, but are you giving them the kind of permission that they need to really, and the kind of support that they need to really make the best decisions on your behalf? And so that's why we wrote the barefoot spirit. We thought, well, it's the spirit behind the brand, you know, the Mm. barefoot spirit. It's like the entrepreneurial spirit, only barefoot style. And so we write this book and we actually wrote it in the way that most books were written for the last 25 years, you know, a typical boring business book that you put down after chapter two. And it goes like this. Here's the three things you got to do, the five things to never do, and the 20 things your customer wants from you, right? Next chapter is basically the same format. And so that kind of an outline format, we just thought was terrible. And we so we threw that book right in the garbage and we did what we always do. We hired somebody who was better than us. And we got a hold of Rick Cushman, who was a writer that we really appreciated. And we said, would you write our book? We want to write it a different way. We want to write it as a story because we believe the best way to communicate business principle is through story and demonstration and not through a kind of a litany of a top-down, you know, prescription text, which is how most business books are written. So we wrote it and, you know, it became a New York Times bestseller for like 18 weeks. We we sold it all over the country. We wound up going on speaking tours. We spoke uh, uh, in the UK. We spoke in Europe. Uh, we've had uh, we've had Russian students. Um, we've we've had people from Southeast Asia and all over America and Canada and uh, South America. And so we we transferred from being wine people into being business people, into being like entrepreneurial teachers, if you will. Mm. And so that's why, you know, and the book really opened the door for that. Um, it's kind of like the business card, you know. Um, but then, then uh, later we decided that we wanted to reach a larger audience because here we were speaking all over the place and we'd come into these big halls and people would come in and as they were filing in, they would be wearing earbuds. And so we'd go up to them and we'd say, hey, what are you listening to? Is it hip hop? Is it rap? And they'd say, oh no, I'm listening to a podcast on how to improve my business. Another woman would say, oh no, I'm listening to a business book. And so we started to realize that this new generation was using audio Mm. to educate themselves because they were screen free and they were able to multitask Mm -hmm. at the same time as listening, whereas, you know, video or print pretty much puts you in one place. So we thought, well, we've got to do it. We got to do an audio book then. That's all there is to it. Right. Mm. So we go out and we, we bought all of the top 10 business audiobooks and we listened to them. And they were all read to you by a narrator. They were not acted out for you. And we thought, wouldn't it be fun to get Hollywood actors and sound effects and music, and instead of reading it to you, we could perform it for you. Mm. And so that's where Business Audio Theater was born. And that brings us up to present. And that's just so much more fun. Oh, it's hilarious. It's, it's just so, so cool and so different and so aligned with your, with your spirit. Love it. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I, I want your listeners to know that we're going to provide them with a free 25-minute episode, which you can have a link to uh, in your show notes or elsewhere. And, you know, they'll have a chance to listen to, you know, a a real rocket ride of here's a business starting up and, you know, then this happens and then this happens. It's kind of like a cliffhanger. But when they get through with the 25 minute episode, hopefully they'll want to buy and download the entire book at that point. But even if that's all they listen to, they, they will 
have a lot of appreciation for the kind of common sense and resourcefulness that's required. And we're not special, super intelligent people. We're just like you, and we're just like everybody else on this planet. And when you're given an opportunity, you scramble. You have to scramble to make it work. So these are humans scrambling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, uh, as I said, I love it. And what an inspirational story. And really to have made it from, as you said, you know, just the very, very humble beginnings with no capital behind you, no knowledge of the wine industry to literally go to the world's most loved and widely sold wine brand is a phenomenal achievement. And even if it did take decades, that is a real power to the testimony of, of grit and perseverance and breaking through those problems and challenges as, as they arose. So I really have to say that I am full of admiration for everything that you've achieved. And thank you so much for joining us today, Michael. Well, thank you. It's been great to have you. And for our listeners, do listen in th to this wonderful link. And thank you very much again. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to the Smart Connector podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, why not head over to janebaylor.com and order a copy of my free report on building your personal brand. I'd love to connect with you on social media. And finally, don't forget to like and subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss a show. Thanks for listening in and see you soon.